Yes. Uh, today, we will take a look at the nature of man uh, because that is relevant to our study of revelation. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, we read, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we notice that the man's whole being comprises a spirit, soul, and body. Uh, so man is said to be tripartite. <clears throat> Some people would say that the spirit and soul are the same. Some others would say, no, they are different. Okay. Uh, we are not going to go too much into that. What we will say is from what we read in God's word, the spirit and the soul are distinct. But they are very intimately connected with each other. Uh, the body is physical, meaning we can see it, we can touch it. It is perceivable to our physical senses. The spirit, soul, however, are non-material. You cannot see, touch, weigh. Uh, a physician's, a surgeon's scalpel will not be able to expose the spirit or the soul. It is not a part of the material world. So, we read in the 139th Psalm, verses 13 to 16, that God created my inmost being. He knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise God because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from God when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together, his eyes saw my unformed body. Okay. So there are two things that are mentioned. There is a part of me that God created. The same word is used here which is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or in other words, God brought into existence something that did not have prior existence. So my inmost being, God created. He brought it into existence out of nothing. Okay, But there is a part of me which is made up of stuff that is already around it. He knits that together. And that is my unformed body. He puts it together like a woman will knit a sweater. He knits me together. My frame was not hidden from him when he was making me. So there is a part of me that God puts together in my mother's womb. And there is a part of me that God brings into existence out of nothing. Okay, so as the highlighted parts can be seen, knit me together, made, woven together. These are about the part of me which is physical. But God created my inmost being. Okay, so uh, we will try to picture it. Now, pictures are symbolic. 
they help us to understand when they have their limitations. God's word is the final authority, not the pictures which we are using to illustrate the word of God. Okay. So, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, see that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. Okay. So, there are two realms that we have pictured in the diagram. The physical realm, which consists of matter, can be seen, can be felt, can be weighed, can be broken. And there is the spiritual realm, which is different from the physical realm. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. So there is a part of me which has the same elements as the earth. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So we are picturing man this way. He became a living being. That is, he became a living soul, as some translations put it. So the soul is me. And this soul, okay, let's read up the verses and then we will talk. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit the soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The soul is the person. Okay. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit his very self. This is another translation. So the person is the soul. One's very self. We're just putting it in terms of the meaning of the word. Okay. We are not saying anything beyond that. The word soul in English means one's very self. That's all. So there is the body. So the body is how the soul interacts with the physical world. Okay, am I loud enough now? This is better than... Okay, sorry. Uh, so the soul interacts with the physical realm through the body. The body has eyes with which the physical world can be seen. The body has ears with which the soul can hear the sounds. It has got a nose with which the soul can experience smell. It has organs of touch. So the body is the interface between the soul and the physical realm. The spirit is the interface of the soul with the realm of the spirit. Okay. We will see this with another illustration done differently later on and then this will become a little clearer. So the soul, my very self, interacts with the realm of the spirit through my spirit. God belongs to the spiritual realm. God is spirit. We read in John 4, 24. His worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The 
will clear these for another illustration. When man sin, sin cut man away from God. This is what sin did. Okay? When man sin, sin cut man away from God so that man could still experience the physical world. But he has lost his connection with God. As you can see, there is only one arrow in this diagram because sin comes between God and man. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face <clears throat> from you so that he will not hear. So uh, God speaks to the prophet Isaiah and says, do you think I am so hard of hearing that I cannot hear you? Do you think my hands are so short that I cannot reach out to help you? No, your sins have separated you from me so that whatever you speak, don't reach my ears. And I cannot reach past the barrier of sin to come to your aid because your iniquities have separated you from your God. A small illustration. There is a man born blind and there is another man who has got in his hand a blue ball. So let us suppose the blind man asks the man with eyes, what do you have in your hand? The man says, I have a blue ball. So the blind man asks, what is a ball? So the man replies, it is something round. So the man asks, what is round? So the man gives him the ball. So the man feels with his hand, ah, he says, this is round. Then the man asks, what is blue? Can the man with the eyes explain blueness to the man who was born blind? No possibility. Correct? Shape can be understood. Texture can be understood. Hardness or softness can be understood even without eyes. But color, not possible. So in the same way, the natural man can understand some things about God. Okay, just as a blind man man born blind, can understand roundness. Some things can be understood. But there are things which the natural man cannot understand. Only the regenerated man can understand certain things about God and the realm of the spirit. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. So as a result, when sin separated man from God, his whole being became corrupted. That is why we have shown a change. Okay? We have changed the color, appearance. Sin has corrupted his body. Sin has corrupted everything about him. Sin has also corrupted his world. So we see in the book of Genesis how thorns and thistles which were not a part of 
God's creation originally became a part of nature after man's sin. Sickness, birth defects, and even death became a part of the human experience because of sin. Sin changed everything. Romans 1.18 tells us the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of man. So between God and man, there is the barrier of sin and there is the wrath of God which is towards man because of his sin. Okay, This can be seen and felt in us and in all of nature. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 3, we read, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So man's state is described as dead in transgressions and sins. So far as God is concerned, he is dead in his transgressions and sins. But man doesn't see himself as dead because he is living. Dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So it is a state which is characterized by man being energized in his disobedience of God by Satan himself. Okay? And it is energized by man following the ways of this world. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. Okay, it was also a state in which we ratified our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. That is how we were. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. That is why we have shown the band of sin separating man from God and then the wrath of God directed towards him. The wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes the judgment, it is, how shall we describe? If you were to take a branch from a tree, break it. It looks alive, but it is cut off from the source of life. So over time, it will die, dry, decompose. In the same way, from birth, a man is born cut off from God. He may look alive, but he is actually dead spiritually and is dying physically and will one day, it will be sealed in eternal death, what the Bible refers to as the second death. Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The natural end of those born in this world, cut off from God. The lake of fire is the second death. So this is what living humans are like. 
they are spiritually dead that is separated from god they will die physically that is will be separated from their bodies and will after the judgment die eternally that is will be eternally separated from god death is about separation from god from life and from everything that is good the nature of salvation so this is sinful man this is the cross of the lord jesus christ we read about how he himself bore our sins in his body so you will notice the sin that separated man from god has been taken away and placed on the lord jesus christ the wrath of god is directed now not towards man but towards the one who is hanging from the cross the lord jesus christ so in 1 john chapter 2 and verse 2 we read he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for those of the whole world the word propitiation means one who turns aside the wrath of god god's wrath that was directed towards man because of his sin is now turned aside and poured on the lord jesus christ because he has become the sin bearer so he himself is the propitiation of our sins to propitiate means to pacify an angry god to satisfy his anger by the death of someone that is what the word propitiate means so he is the propitiation for our sins in turning away the wrath of god towards himself he pacified the wrath of god and not ours only but for those of the whole world okay so we remember jesus died on the cross he died for the whole world not just for a select small group of people as some would claim the word propitiation means one who turns aside the wrath of god taking away sin i said i have 53 and verse 5 tells us he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him god was reconciling the world to himself in christ not counting men's sins against them so this is what when christ died on the cross potentially every human being was reconciled to god potentially god did all that needed to be done by him for man's for effecting man's reconciliation after that it is up to man god was reconciling the world to himself not counting men's sins against them god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so from god's side he did all that was needed on the cross to reconcile man to himself now it is up to man whoever believes in him whoever puts his trust in the lord jesus christ whoever entrusts himself to jesus shall not perish but have eternal life colossians 1 21 22 
very beautiful passage. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Okay, that's how we were in the past. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you, listen very carefully, holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. Okay? Not only am I forgiven my sin, but God has swept away every accusation against me. Even the accusations don't remain free from accusation without blemish, free from accusation. So, we show a change. Now, it is possible for man to relate to God once again because he is reconciled. But you will notice the color of those double arrows is still different because his relationship with God exists, but it is still from a body that is accustomed to sin. As time passes, as the Spirit of God does this work of grace in him, this relationship will improve. Okay? Nothing can cut that relationship because the moment a man puts his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there are five important words immediately. Unconditionally. Completely. Freely and permanently he is forgiven. But much can be done to improve one's relationship with God as we continue to renounce and to forsake every sin in our lives and strengthen our walk with him and experience intimacy with him. As a result of a closer walk with God, there is improved health in my body. Okay? And an improved relationship with the world. As I obey God, there is a change that is there. It is not that I will be completely free from sickness and suffering in this world. No. That is for the future. Where we read towards the end of the book of Revelation, there shall be no more sickness, no more death, no more sorrow, no more curse. That's in the future. But a close walk with God will show in our bodies. It will show in our minds. This improves our whole being as we allow the Spirit of God to do His work of grace in us. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. What we showed is what happens to a person who puts his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, God's wrath remains on him. It is not taken away from him. It remains on him. He will not see life. 
if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. This is what he declares in his word. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant and sanctified him, and who has insulted the spirit of grace? We know him who said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the state of those who continue in sin, rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. How shall we escape, scripture says, if we ignore such a great salvation? We cannot ignore. We have to act on it. Now that we have seen the nature of man and the nature of salvation, let's take a look at the nature of death. So these are two people. The wrath of God is on them. They cannot interact with God. They can only interact with nature physically. Okay. The person on the left has put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God has been taken away. Okay. You will notice, or even the person of on the right, okay, there is no sin we have shown because Christ took the sin of every human being and died on the cross. But if he rejects Christ, then the wrath of God will continue because his sin will remain on him. Both of them die. You will notice their bodies are remaining on the earth. The man on the left he is able to relate to God but death has cut him off from the physical world. The one on the right, death cut him also off from the physical world. But he has no relationship with God. So we have now shown him completely enveloped in the wrath of God. There is no, as we read in Hebrews, no sacrifice for sins is left. There is no way he can be saved because he has burned the spirit of grace. So there is no hope for him. He cannot interact with God. He is cut off from God completely, permanently. Okay. <clears throat> uh, in James, Chapter 2 and verse 26, we read, the body without the spirit is dead. And the dead body of both the man whose sin is forgiven, the man whose sin is not forgiven, both of them, their bodies will decompose and turn to the dust. So we've shown that as God. Okay. Back to the nature of man. Here is another way of 
looking at things. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1, the Lord who forms the spirit of man within him. The spirit of man is within the man, within his body. So we are showing a slightly different picture from the one we showed before. This is the man's very self, his soul. This is his body. The soul interacts with the world through the body. Then the spirit is how the man can interact with God. So he can interact on the inside also. Now this is when God created Adam, how man was supposed to be. Okay. Interact with nature physically. Interact with God within. So there are two ways a man can interact with God. If you would like the outer arrow, if you go back to that illustration of the man born blind, the outer arrow, you can perceive shape, cannot perceive color. Inner arrow perceives color. So there are things which can be known about God only as he reveals to my spirit. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 15 is another illustration. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live. Who? Peter. I live in the tent of this body. So the body is pictured as a tent in which the real Peter, the soul of Peter, lived in. Because I know that I will soon put it aside the tent as the Lord Jesus has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, he will always be able to remember these things. He says one day he is going to leave this tent and go away at his death. We will continue a little bit more to understand the nature of man. The soul, that's me. The body, my interface with the physical world. My spirit, my interface with God. Okay? We have symbolically shown God this way. can interact with God living within me. So we turn to the tabernacle and the temple in the Bible. You will notice we have used the same colors that were used in the previous illustration to help us to understand something. Okay, so this is the tabernacle. You will notice to the top right, a compass is shown. So north is up, south is down, east is to the right, west is to the left. Okay, this is how the tabernacle and later on the temple were oriented. Okay, and the proportions are the same as what is given in the Bible. All right. So this is the outer court. This is referred to as the inner court. This is the holy place. And the holy of holies 
or the most holy place. Okay. Then there is a veil separating the holy place from the inner court and another veil separating, another curtain separating the holy of holies from the holy place. So this is how the priest would enter the inner court. So we go back to Genesis chapter 3. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth. So Adam was expelled from the garden and cherubim were posted to prevent Adam from returning to the garden. Where were the cherubim placed? On the east side. So the garden of Eden had a gate on the east side. Man was expelled towards the east. So accordingly, in the tabernacle, man entered from the east because the whole tabernacle is to set forth the relationship between God and man. So man had been expelled and now the way back to God is from the east. The tabernacle itself looked like this. Okay. So some of the things are mentioned over here. There is the altar of burnt offering, the labor, then the veil through which the holy place is entered into. Then in the holy place, on the north side, is the table of shoe bread. On the south side is the menorah. Then there is the altar of incense. And then in the holy of holies, there is the ark of the covenant with the Shekinah glory of God. Okay. We stop over here and God willing, we will continue coming week and see how this is like us. This body is like the outer coat. The soul is like the holy place and my spirit like the holy of holies where when I am saved the spirit of God takes up his residence. So the spirit of man was designed by God to be the place where God's spirit will reside. So the man interacts with the world through his body and with God, the Holy Spirit, through his spirit. He is the holy place, but more of it in the coming week. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts that we pray, Lord, that even as we remember that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, we will learn to walk in holiness before you. Keep us reminded, Lord, that we have been bought at a price and are therefore not our own. And we must reflect even in our bodies your glory. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In the precious and worthy name of the Lord Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. Over to Amen. you, brother.